Hello, I'm here to talk to you about fa fantasy today, but before that, you may have noticed uh, I have a new thing. Look it, it's a plushie, and it's me. See, wait, no, hold on, I gotta put the glasses on. It's me. See, isn't that amazing? I teamed up with Gimme Swag recently, and we are making a whole line of these. So, if you want one, and you should want one, obviously. I mean, look at this thing. It's the best. It's adorable. It's just me. But <laughs> if you want one, then check the link in the pinned comment down below for more information. These are limited time. You know, you, you can't wait forever. Please, go ahead, grab one as soon as you can. <laughs> look at his feet move. This is the introduction song. It's not very good, but it's not too long. So, fantasy. And I don't know if you can hear it raining outside. I apologize if you can't, but... So, fantasy. I I love fantasy. That should be no surprise to anyone who watches this channel. Like, you can see this whole shelf right here next to me. This is all fantasy and sci-fi, and it's not even close to my entire collection. There's a lot of it, and there's a lot of different types of fantasy. You know, there's epic fantasy, urban fantasy, low fantasy anime fantasy, which is very much its own thing. There's a whole bunch of different types, and they're all different, they're all still fantasy, and they're all great in their own ways. But all genres do have issues, you know, because a genre is something that, well, when things are in the same genre, that implies that they have similar settings and similar story types, similar story structures, they have similar character archetypes, you know, things like that. And so as a result, genres do have problems, and a lot of times those problems are similar across a lot of different entries in that genre. And sometimes an entire genre will just hit a rut and be stuck in there for a while until somebody comes up with new ideas and helps elevate it out of that. Like, I feel epic fantasy was in a rut for a long, long time until Mistborn came along, and I don't want to assign the entirety of the genre's success to Mistborn, but Mistborn was something different that inspired people to try different things. Uh, and, you know, I just wanted to point out things in different subgenres of fantasy that really annoy me, that I just, I don't know, I just wanted to point out the problems and come up with some hypothetical solutions for them. First up is gonna be epic fantasy. Now, epic fantasy is basically what a lot of people think of when they hear the term fantasy. You know, this is something like Lord of the Rings, or Wheel of Time, or Stormlight Archive. It's something that takes place in a world completely different than our own, at least, usually. Sometimes it's like our world in the future, but I've talked about that enough. That's kind of dumb. Uh, it's usually an epic story about characters taking on world-threatening events and trying to save the world. Uh, it usually has really, really huge casts. There's huge battles all over the place most of the time. And that is basically what most people think of when they think of fantasy, but that is epic fantasy. And I love epic fantasy, but my biggest problem with it, by far, is that so often these stories, they need to be long, but they do not need to be bloated. And that's what happens. The stories and the casts just become bloated. Like, there is too much there. Like, this is a genre where it's very common for books that, or book series that are supposed to be like trilogies to turn into like seven books. You know, A Song of Ice and Fire, I believe, was originally planned as five books, and now it's a planned seven, the last two of which is, they're just never coming out. It's not happening, guys. Uh, like, the third book, uh, or excuse me, the fourth book, A Feast for Crows, was originally supposed to be everything from Feast for Crows and everything from A Dance with Dragons. But George R. R. Martin just wrote too much and realized, hey, there's too much here, I guess I'll split it into two books. Wheel of Time was originally supposed to be a six-book series, and it wound up being 14 books and a prequel. Like... I don't know if mission creep is the right term, but let's call it, like, story creep. You know, that is a thing that happens a lot in epic fantasy. Like, it just, the authors keep going, oh, what if we added this? Ooh, what if we added that? It'd be cool if we put this in, and then in order to put that thing in that they think is cool. I'm sorry, like, there's something caught in my eyelashes. It is not going away no matter what I do. Uh, and in order to put the thing in that they think is cool, they first have to justify it, which means building up to it earlier in the story, adding characters that relate to it in some way. It means uh, putting in more world building so that it uh, is justified and so that you can build up to it. Like, just you have to add in a whole lot of stuff before you can even get to the thing, 
which is sometimes just underwhelming, but whatever. Like, just, authors don't like to kill their darlings, basically, and the publishers and editors just let them get away with this sort of thing, and so these stories, these series just get way, way, way too long. This leads to issues with pacing, like I mentioned Wheel of Time earlier, and that is a series that is infamous for having what fans call the slog, which is this big chunk in the middle of several books that are each like 700 pages where almost nothing happens and it's just very, very difficult to get through. Uh, and for whatever reason, it also leads to a lot more romance than you would normally expect, and it's never good. Because, like, again, they have to add in these new characters in order to justify stuff that's going on, and these characters, like, well, we have to give them some personality, and a lot of times what they do to give them some personality and some development is just have them develop romances, but the romances are almost never good. And this is basically why uh, A Song of Ice and Fire and King Killer Chronicles are never going to be finished. Like I mentioned Song of Ice and Fire, it's never being finished. Winds of Winter, Dream of Spring, they're just not coming out. George W. R. Martin has thrown in so much crap, and he has not been able to figure out a way to tie it all together, and so he's, he's just given up. And same with King Killer Chronicles. Like, the second book was not entirely filler, but largely filler. And so the author just doesn't know how to squeeze everything into the final book, and he kind of hamstrung himself so he can't just stretch it out even more. It has to be a trilogy. So, like, it just... They, we're just not getting the final books because these things just let themselves get too bloated. The solution to this, and I'm not just gonna give something really vague, like, oh, just cut out unnecessary subplots or anything like that. I'm going to give something a little more specific, and that is trim down the character cast. Like, take all the characters you have. Like, if you have dozens of named characters, just take, like, 10% of them, get rid of them all together. You know, like, there, again, part of this mission creep of these epic fantasy series is often that they will throw in minor characters and then feel the need to expand on them and give them entire long storylines. Or uh, they introduce like a new area or a new small subplot and so they have to introduce a new character whose POV we can follow for at least a little while to introduce us to that. And a lot of times this just, well, it wastes a lot of time. Like not every plot point needs a new POV character to explain. Like, sometimes you can just imply that things happen off screen, you don't need to give us all the details, and sometimes you can have characters that are already established witness it, and even though that it occasionally can feel contrived to have the same people going all over the place and seeing important events everywhere, but, you know, if you're smart about it, it won't feel contrived. And also just let minor characters be minor characters. You know, they don't all need to have really rich backstories and lives and developments and everything. You know, like, uh, Lesta Borns in Mistborn is a pretty good example of this. Like, in the first two books, he's there, he does things, he has some personality, he helps out with the, the main cast and everything, but he's not really that important, he doesn't have a whole lot of development, he doesn't have his own story arc or anything. Uh, it's really only in the third book that he becomes more important, and I mean, that's fine, but I mean, like, his character in the first two books is a pretty good example of a minor character just being a minor character and still adding to the story, and a lot of epic fantasy stories could learn from that example. Like, just trim down the character cast and you will trim the fat without even really trying beyond that. Next up, we have young adult fantasy, and I'm gonna be honest, it's kind of weird that this is a genre. Because genre, like I said earlier, implies that stories will have similar settings, similar character archetypes, similar s types of stories being told, whereas young adult just makes it sound like it's stories that are aimed at young adults. You know, they don't necessarily have anything in common beyond that. But at some point, YA fantasy did become an entire genre. I, I say at some point, or for some reason, like it was thrown up glass. Like that was it. Pretty much everything for the past like 10 years has just been following exactly what Throne of Glass did, and I hate Throne of Glass so much, you already know that, but it's a really bad series, and everything is just following that, which means it basically is a genre, even though it shouldn't be. This would be stuff like, again, Throne of Glass, or An Ember in the Ashes, or Light Lark, or Children of Blood and Bone, or a dozen others. And these tend to be defined by main characters who are just ultra-special chosen ones, you know, they, they have everything about them. You know, they have, like, the coolest magic powers ever. They are the bestest fighters of all time. Everybody loves them. They're so beautiful. They're the chosen one. They're also possibly the lost heir to the kingdom. And this, 
this will be like all all in one character. You know, they, they this genre is very much defined by ultra special Mary Sue protagonists. Uh, it's also sometimes defined by having casts that are way too small, which is kind of weird. Uh, that's like the opposite problem that epic fantasy has, but a lot of times young adult fantasy will have uh, everything happening to the same small group of people and it feels like the rest of the world doesn't even exist outside of them. It's also typically defined by a really, really, really heavy focus on romance. <laughs> like, don't think I need to explain that one much more than than that. It's just, there's a very heavy focus on it. It's there. And I know, I know I'm sounding, like, really harsh here. I kind of wish I didn't hate this genre, because a lot of times it does have, like, really, really good setup for, setups for stories. Like, I've mentioned before that Lightlark has a really good setup for a cool story. It just does nothing with it. And I feel the same about a lot of other young adult fantasy. Uh, and... Occasionally I'll find something I like, and by occasionally I'll find something I like, I mean I liked an ember in the ashes and that's it, <laughs> but, you know, like, there, it could be worse. You know, I just blame Sarah J. Moss for the current state of things. So that's a lot of problems there, but what's the biggest problem? You know, it's not the fact that romance takes up a heavy part of the story, because, I mean, I'm usually not into that, and a lot of times the romances are bizarre and toxic, but that's not really the issue. That's that's more just like, okay, don't do a toxic romance, but that's easier said than done, and I don't think anyone is going to listen to me anyways, because that just all romances seem to be toxic, it seems. Uh, the problem isn't even, like, the, the main characters being, like, ultra-special chosen ones, because I can theoretically see how that would work, or at least how it would bother me less if it were in a better story. Like, if we had the ultra-special chosen one story, uh, and just put them into uh, a series I actually like, like, uh, I don't know, Mistborn or something, then I would not like that. It would drag the story down, but I think overall I'd still enjoy it. So that's not the issue. Uh, it's not that these things are always spy plots. I swear to God, like, every YA fantasy is just a spy plot. You know, it is just main character needs something. In order to get something, she has to infiltrate the stronghold of the evil people and pretends to not be ultra special powerful Mary Sue girl and while she's there she falls in love with a bad boy or something like th that's uh, that's all of them all of them are spy plots it's really annoying but that's not the biggest issue the biggest issue by far which does kind of tie into all these others is the general lack of creativity or imagination and i know that that's vague so let me explain myself fantasy is a genre where you can just really go crazy in a lot of ways. Like the setting and the magic and everything, you can go really, really nuts with that, but YA fantasy never does. Like, it is almost always the exact same thing, or something very similar to the exact same thing. Like, it's almost always, based on medieval Europe, the worlds don't have a whole lot of depth to them. Like, there'll be a map, and that's it. Like, we'll have one kingdom which is vaguely good, I guess, and we'll have the evil empire which wants to expand and conquer everything, and then there'll be like a magic kingdom, I guess, which is like usually the fey realm because all these books are about having sex with fairies for some reason. And sometimes they'll use a different culture to base this off of, but even then it still winds up feeling like the exact same thing with a slightly different surface level, level aesthetic. Like I mentioned Children of Blood and Bone, that one is uh, based on West African mythology and everything, which is really, really neat, and I thought it'd be different, but it, it's not. It's just the exact same world, exact same setting, but it's slightly different on the surface. That, that's it. And, and Ember in the Ashes, again, I like it, and that one's based more on uh, Middle Eastern mythology and folklore, but that one is largely, again, the same thing, only instead of fairies doing crazy things, we have jinn doing crazy things. You know, it's it, 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 like, these are all pretty much the same. And it's not even that they're all the same, but that, like, none of them really go crazy and do anything cool or, uh, well, crazy, you know? Like, think about all the YA fantasy you can think of, it, at least if you're a fan of the genre. Like, are there any locations in any of those books that are anything like, say, Luthadel from Mistborn, where it's the capital city of this thousand-year-old empire run by an immortal demigod who most people never even see. 
and it's near these uh, volcanoes which are constantly erupting and dropping ash down on top of everything and these mists come out at night and the mist almost seems alive like is there anything like that or how about uh the fey realm from king killer chronicles you know like where a place where time doesn't exist and there's all these crazy creatures running around including a demon who is trapped in a tree and he can see into the future and if you ever interact with him he knows exactly how you will uh, react to anything he says, so he's going to say something to you that will cause the maximum amount of death and destruction, or basically any of the demon realms from the Demonata, <laughs> which, like, there are some really nutty ones in there, like the one made entirely out of spider webs, or the one where the entire realm is itself a living demon made of fire, and when they kill the demon, the entire realm vanishes. Like, or, this one's not a book, but uh, Landell from Elden Ring, which is this gigantic abandoned city, like, you go through, and everything is destroyed and sealed up, and, at, and when you first enter, you see the corpse of this gigantic dragon just in the middle of the city. We don't know exactly how it died, but that implies a couple of things. Uh, and underneath all, and it's all underneath this gigantic tree, it's glowing, it's several kilometers tall, like it's so massive that if you stood at the base of it, you couldn't even see the entire width of the trunk. Like, these are crazy, crazy locations, and that's one of the great parts of fantasy, but young adult fantasy never really does anything like that with its locations. Or it's magic, you know? Magic tends to be very simple and to the point, and a lot of times, again, because of Throne of Glass, and actually, I will say, Throne of Glass uh, has one cool location, and that is the gigantic glass castle that the first book mostly takes place in. You know, it's, again, a castle made entirely of glass. It's, like, hundreds and hundreds of feet tall. It just dominates this entire city. It's enormous. You know, that that's kind of cool. I, I did like that. Uh, but anyways, magic tends to be very simple and to the point in these series. Like, it is, this person can make fire, this person can transform, and there's really nothing else to it besides that. It's just, yeah, we can do cool things with magic, and we don't really have to spend a long time learning how to use it, and the only cost to it is that we get kind of tired while we're using it, and the main character doesn't get tired easy. She has the bestest powers. Woo! This is not a problem that epic fantasy has, because epic fantasy has, in the past couple of decades, been giving out these really weird, crazy, out-there magic systems. Like, just off the top of my head, what if, and if you're a young adult author, feel free to f use this, please. Uh, what if there was a magic system that was controlled by injuring yourself? You know, like, if you give yourself a paper cut, then that would release a bit of power and you could do something small with that. If you broke your finger, you could do something bi bigger with that. If you cut your entire arm off, then you could do something really crazy, but then you, you don't have an arm, so... You know, you gotta weigh the risk and reward of this. You know, like, you know, just off the top of my head, something like that, you know, something really crazy and neat like that would be interesting. And this is all the solution that I'm getting at. Like, you know, the, the problem is lack of creativity and imagination. Just use creativity and imagination. Like, even if you leave the plot the exact same, which you shouldn't, like, you know, use a little bit more creativity there too. Try and do different things with it. But even if you left, like, the plot the same and the character archetypes all the same, just by having uh, the settings be really weird and out there like that, you would do crazy stuff with it, and it would be much more interesting and much more fun to read, you know? And you don't necessarily have to be, like, crazy out there and imaginative and come up with something no one else has ever done before, uh, but just do something cool with it. Like, again, the Castle of Glass from Throne of Glass is cool. It's not the most imaginative thing ever, but it, it's neat. Next up is going to be urban fantasy. Now, urban fantasy is fantasy that takes place mostly in an urban setting, in cities, uh, and it's usually, when people talk about it, they're referring to seri book series where uh, it takes place in our world, but there is a hidden magical underground in there. And a lot of times, urban fantasy will also be more lighthearted than other stuff. Not always, but a lot of times. Like, several years ago I read a book called Doppelgangster, which is a really fun book, by the way. And I actually don't read a whole lot of urban fantasy, but that one is really good. What's the biggest problem with urban fantasy? Well, 
to me, it's that the world is never really integrated with ours. Like, the magical world is never integrated with ours. Like, it keeps itself hidden from ordinary view, and other than that, it is just its own thing. You know, the two don't really interact with or affect one another in any real way. And a lot of times, it's hidden just because. You know, I've gone on about this many times, I know, but, like, I always find myself wondering, like, okay, sure, with modern technology, maybe humans could overpower the magical creatures and kill them all if they felt like it, so they stay hidden. Like, that makes sense. That wasn't the case, like, 3,000 years ago, so why didn't they do anything with their crazy powers that most people have don't have that back then? You know, they could have taken over and ruled the entire world back then and then prevented humanity from developing any of the technology we have now. Like, that... I don't know. Like, there's never really a reason given for why it's hidden. This is a problem that people have brought up with Harry Potter over the past however many years. Like, there's a lot of talk about how, okay, why don't the human, the muggle and wizard worlds interact at all? Like, even if the majority of people don't know about it, like, wouldn't they still affect each other in some ways? And like, just hand wavy them and suddenly they, they apparently just, they, they just exist that way. I don't know, it doesn't make sense. And a lot of urban fantasy is like that. So what is the solution to this? Well, it's to integrate the worlds more. And again, I know that's vague, so let me explain. What if the mayor of the city that it takes place in is a wizard? You know, he, he's not open about it, but he uses magic to uh, help himself in his political career in some subtle ways. Like, he could be a villain, he could be the main character, he could be a side character that the heroes just interact with briefly. Like, there's a lot you could do with this, and it shows that, okay, these two worlds do interact with and affect one another in some ways. Or how about there's a bunch of fairies who have to move their underground dwelling because there's a housing development being built there. And like, that could just be a small detail, or you could build the whole plot around that, really. Or, hell, how about, what if vampires controlled the stock market somehow? You know, just, just an idea like that. Like, how do these worlds interact with and affect one another at all? You could do that in a funny way, you could do it in a dramatic way, but just, I don't know, it feels like a lot of the time urban fantasy is only urban fantasy because they want to have maximum wish fulfillment and projection for the people reading it. They want them to be able to go, oh, he just like me, for real, for real, when the main character like is a badass detective who gets all the girls and gets to go on an adventure while also living in the same mundane world that they live in. Speaking of pointless projection in power fantasy, next up is isekai. Now, isekai just means different world or other world in Japanese. So basically, any story where a character goes from our world into some other crazy world to go on adventures it could technically be an isekai. You know, classics like Alice in Wonderland, Gulliver's Travels, uh, The Wizard of Oz, The Odyssey, like, those would all be isekai. But when I say isekai, really I'm referring to the modern trend in Japanese anime, manga, and light novels, which is where total blank, s blank slate, like literally zero personality, zero life before the events of the story, main character, who is always a Japanese teenage boy, somehow gets sent to another world. It's usually not explained all that well. Like, uh, a lot of times it's just, hey, you died and now you're being reincarnated into this other world. Have fun, good luck. And then when main character Kun goes to this other world, he just has crazy powers for no reason. Like, this is the male equivalent of young adult fantasy, basically. <laughs> like, he just has crazy powers for no reason a lot of the time, and so he just steamrolls most of his obstacles, and then there's basically no plot or structure. Like, there's no goal he's working towards. He doesn't want to go home. He doesn't want to defeat the bad guys. He's just kind of chilling in this world, going from place to place, being awesome. And then there's also a harem of hot girls who are really, really into him, but he never starts any relationships with any of them. They never kiss or hold hands or have sex or anything. They are just kind of there. And sometimes one of them will get jealous and physically assault him. And that's like comedy, I guess. So that, yeah, that, that's isekai. That's what I'm referring to here. Now this one is like young adult fantasy and they both have many, many different problems that they suffer from a lot of the time. However, with this one, the single biggest problem is that there is no plot or structure whatsoever. Like, it is often just main character Kuhn wandering from battle to battle. Uh, occasionally, he'll add 
new harem members, and because he's just so overpowered, he's boring to watch. You know, it's not fun to watch him and go like, oh, I wonder how he's going to get out of this scrape. Like, he just overpowers everybody, goes through it. And because he is just a complete blank character with no per definable personality or redeeming characteristics or anything, he's not interesting to watch in that way either. So even people who are really into this type of power fantasy or something will get bored pretty quickly of this. Let that be a lesson to all writers of all stripes. If you want your readers to be invested in the story, there has to feel like there's some progress being made. And that's the solution to this one. Just give it a fucking plot, dude. <laughs> you know, I like that's so basic that I feel like I shouldn't have to explain it, but apparently I do. Like, just give it a plot. Give it a story. You know, main character Kuhn goes there, and what does he want to do? Like, he maybe he wants to go home, and so the whole adventure is his long-ass journey trying to get home, and all of the uh, side quests and distractions he has to go on on the way there. Like, you could do a lot with that, make a long-running series, make it short. Who cares? Or what if there's an evil demon lord who has taken over everything, and he's the chosen one that's there to stop him, so he has to go to various places and gather up allies and use them to defeat the armies of the Demon King. Like, you know, he goes to this place and there's a problem there, and once he helps the people with the problem there, then suddenly they're free and they can go help him. Then he goes to the next place and does that, and then at the end there's a big final battle. And this is basically the plot to Dragon Age Origins, but whatever, that game is awesome. So like, yeah, just, if, if you want to make a good isekai, just make it Dragon Age Origins. There you go. And last up on the list today is going to be low slash dark fantasy. Now, these are not the same thing. I have gone over this before. Low fantasy versus high fantasy is a spectrum of how much magic and, magic and fantastical elements are in your story. Like, you know, if there's a whole bunch of elves running around and magic is all over the place and tons of other weird stuff in there, that's high fantasy. Or if it is mostly mundane and only a little bit of magic and everything in there, like Game of Thrones being the most obvious example, that's low fantasy. Whereas dark fantasy is, as the name implies, stuff that is, you know, darker in terms of tone. Like, there's a lot more death and rape and destruction and all sorts of uh, unpleasantness in there. Like, low fantasy and dark fantasy have a lot of overlap, which is why I'm talking about them together, but they're not the same thing. Like, you can have high fantasy that is really dark and depressing in tone, like Dark Souls being a good example, and you could theoretically have low fantasy, which is still, like, fun and whimsical. Low slash dark fantasy is, as I was saying, often defined by having very little actual fantasy elements in there. Like, they occasionally will pop up, but there's not a lot of them. Uh, there's a lot of death and torture and horrible things happening to people. Characters are constantly dying left, right, and center, etc. Basically, just anything that was trying to rip off Game of Thrones and cash in on that success... <laughs> which I think that's slowed down now, but for a couple of years there, there were a lot of television shows that were trying to cash in on that, and there's just anything like that. That's what I'm talking about here. So what's the problem? Well, a lot of times they aren't dark so much as edgy, like, and there's also so little fantasy that it doesn't even feel like fantasy. It feels like a historical drama. Like, instead of having characters die in order to, like, be shocking and have it make sense with their character arc or anything, They'll just introduce a whole bunch of characters, one right after another, and then develop them and like, ooh, the audience will care now, and then kill them off and be like, ooh, aren't you shocked? And like the first time it works, but then they do it three, four, five, six more times, and it just, you stop getting attached to them uh, because all of these people keep dying, but then the main core cast still stays the same, you know, so, and then obviously they throw in like a bunch of sexual assaults and stuff not for any, like, intelligent reason. They're not really handling it in any impressive, intelligent way. It's just there to make you go, oh, that person's bad. Ooh, this world is dark. And then again, like, there, there's so little fantasy here, rather than the fantasy showing up occasionally, and it's, like, a big deal when it shows up. You know, like, at the end of the first season of Game of Thrones, when the dragon showed up, that's a big deal. Or, hell, even in the first scene of that show, when the White Walkers first appear, you're like, oh, God, this is a big deal. Uh, because it's contrasted with all of this mun mundane stuff surrounding it. And as the show goes on and we just get more and more used to the mundane stuff, once the magical stuff kicks up, it just is a really big deal. But if you don't actually have the magical stuff, then it doesn't do that. The solution to this problem? 
I know this might sound counterintuitive, but trust me on this. Just put less death in there. Like, I, I really mean that. Just put less death in your low fantasy stories. That way, it means more when it actually happens. Like, again, I keep going back to Game of Thrones, but this is, like, really the best example of this sort of thing. And everyone and their grandmother who's doing this is just trying to be Game of Thrones. But uh, throughout the first season, there aren't any major character deaths until Ned Stark is killed. Like, before that, like, sure, side characters are dying, so we understand, like, yes, this is a harsh world and bad things happen, but uh, we, we feel like the main core cast is safe, and then Ned Stark dies, and it's like, oh, that's a big deal. Uh, and as the series goes on, like, core cast members do die, but it is still done sparingly, and when it does happen, it's a big deal. Like, if they did that every other episode, then, well, it just it just wouldn't work that well. Like, ju just use less death, but still have it there, and you'll hit that balance where it'll work a lot better as dark fantasy slash low fantasy. And on top of that, the magical elements, like, put a little bit more of them in there. <laughs> like, if you can't think of how to put more in there, just base the main conflict around magic. You know, like, again, Game of Thrones, the first scene of that show is some dudes getting killed by snow zombies in the woods. So from the beginning, we know that the snow magical snow zombies, the magical threat, is a threat. And then, uh, as the show goes on, like, sure, we're invested in all of this fighting over the Iron Throne and Daenerys conquering it, her whole area thing, yeah, yada yada. We're, we're invested in all that, but we know in the back of our minds, even when the White Walker threat isn't being focused on, that that is there and that will kill everyone if they don't do something to stop it. So the main conflict, sort of, is based in that. And if you do that, if you have the main conflict based in some sort of magic, then even with uh, the rest of everything around that not being that magical, you will still feel fantastical. It will still feel like fantasy, and then when the magical elements really show up, it, it's a big deal. Like, another example of this would be Carnival Row. Like, most of the magic in that show is, like, it's not common. There's not a lot of it. But the primary conflict of season one is trying to go after this serial killer who's using weird magical stuff. And a big part of the world is the uh, racism and divides between all the different races. So, like, there's humans, and then there's, like, fairies and satyrs and, like, just all these magical races and everything. So the main conflict is still rooted in the fantastical elements. It's still rooted in the fantasy part of the story. That's all I have for today. Uh, so let me know down below, what, what are some of the biggest problems you have with subgenres of fantasy, and how would you like to see them fixed? You know? Like, I, I saw some people on my Discord mention that they really hated that, especially in young adult fantasy, they hated that, oh, all the people with magic are horribly oppressed when it would really make more sense to do it the other way around. You know, like, that. that is a weird, weirdly common trope. I don't know why it's a thing. But, you know, examples like that. Like, what are some things that annoy you in various genres of fantasy? How would you fix them? Uh, I don't know how to end these things. I'm never good at ending these things. Uh, follow me on social media. Subscribe if you haven't. Like the video. Patreon. I do words good. Goodbye. Wow, you, you're still watching? I, I mean, I guess I appreciate it, but I'm not sure why. I mean, at this point, all that we have left is... All these names here, these are my patrons, and including my $10 and up patrons. Apo Savalainen, Olivia Rayan, Brother Santodes, Buffy Valentine, Carolina Clay, Dan Antselievich, Dark King, Dawn, Dio, Echo, Flax, Karkat Kitsune, Lexi Delorme, Liza Rudakova, Lord Tiebreaker, Micaphone, Mistboy, Peep the Toad, Roby Reviews, Sad Mardigan, Sillier the Vixen, Stone Stairs, Tesla Shark, Ve Victus, and Wesley. These are all great people, you know? Let me, let me just, let me tell you. If you want to get your name on here, then consider donating to me once a month. Become a patron. Or if you don't feel like doing that, or you just can't because, you know, you're like poor or whatever. No shame in that. Uh, then just, you know, rate the video, comment on it, subscribe, share it around, spam it to all your friends. And uh, yeah, goodbye.